Hello, my name is Jonas, and this is the ultimate introduction on how to create HDR video. This tutorial is based on my master thesis, HDR and the Colorist, and contains both a theoretical section and a practical section, which will give you the understanding you need to start creating high dynamic range video. In the theoretical section, I will go through the five key parameters of digital imaging technology, and also talk about the ST2084 standard and the PQ curve. In the practical section, I will get into the hardware and software required to start color grading in HDR, and also show you how I created my first HDR video for YouTube. So, let's get started. HDR, or High Dynamic Range Video, is a fairly new technology, which only been around for a couple of years commercially. HDR video should not be confused with HDR photography, which is something totally different. To understand High Dynamic Range Video better, I will go through the five key parameters of digital imaging technology, which is spatial resolution, temporal resolution, quantization, contrast, and color gamut. These five parameters can be divided into either having quantitative properties or qualitative properties, meaning either contributing to the amount of pixels in an image or the quality of the pixels. The quantitative properties are quite straightforward and easy to describe, and it's all about resolution both spatial and temporal. Spatial resolution regards the amount of pixels in an image and is described by the amount of vertical and horizontal rows of pixels. For example, 1920 by 1080 for Full HD or 3840 by 2160 for UHD 4K. Temporal resolution refers to the frequency or refresh rate of a video signal known as frames per seconds or FPS. In cinema, 24 FPS is very common and basically the standard, although we have seen examples of higher frame rates, for example with the 3D HFR versions of The Hobbit. Raising the spatial and temporal resolutions will simply put results in more pixels more often. Finally, when you see attributes such as 1080p30, it refers strictly to resolution, both spatial and temporal. If higher quantitative properties can be described as more pixels more often, then higher qualitative properties can be described as a larger volume of possible pixel brightness and color values with finer numerical gradation. Let's find out why. The finer numerical gradation part refers to quantization, which is the process of converting an analog signal into numerical values called samples. 8-bit quantization means that the signal is quantized to 2 to the 8th power, or 256 code values. In the world of RGB color, this means 256 code values of red, green and blue. And together, these three channels make up the entire color palette of 16.7 million colors in 8-bit. Even if 16.7 million colors intuitively might seem like a lot, it's actually quite limiting and can result in banding artifacts over areas with fine gradation, such as the sky. Since there are only 256 code values per channel in 8-bit, there is also only 256 code values between black and white, where all three channels are used in the same amount to create different shades of grey. To put this into perspective, 256 shades of grey in 8-bit can be compared to 1024 in 10-bit, or 4096 in 12 bit. The contrast or dynamic range of a TV refers to its luminance, the minimum and maximum amount of brightness the display is able to produce. While luminance is measured in candela per square meter, also known as nits, the contrast is presented as a ratio between the darkest and the brightest level the display can produce, for example 1500 to 1. And the maximum amount of brightness in standard dynamic range or SDR is limited to 100 nits. Contrast dynamic range, or tonal range, is the parameter that directly relates to HDR, which raises the maximum brightness value several times, theoretically up to 10,000 nits with Dolby Vision. This added brightness allows for a much greater highlight differentiation, and can result in a less flat image. Another possibility is to work with a variable black and white level, known as tonal ranging. Here you can create a temporal contrast when going from a bright scene to a dark scene, for example. In this case, the audience's eyes might have to adjust from the brightness to the darkness, creating extra tension to complement the story. 
Last of these five parameters is color gamut, or color space, which defines the reach or richness of hues. The CIA 1931 chromaticity diagram, also known as the color horse shoe, was created specifically to encompass all the colors the average human can see, and different color gammas encompass various amounts of this diagram. The legacy color space BT709, also known as Rec709, leaves a large set of visible colors that cannot be rendered, while wider color spaces such as DCI-P3 or Rec2020 is able to render more of these visible colors. Related to color gamut is the concept of color volume, which is a fairly new term within industry. Color volume regards both high dynamic range and wider color gamuts, which are becoming linked within different standards. There are some misconceptions regarding color volume, where a statement can be that the combination of high dynamic range and wider color spaces can result in things like a bright blue sky. And this relates primarily to high dynamic range and not its combination with wider color gamuts. If you want full 100 nits of brightness in SDR, then you won't have any color, since all three RGB channels are used at the maximum value, resulting in white. And this is because the RGB system is additive. HDR raises the maximum brightness level, meaning that you now can have things like a bright blue sky or bright yellow fire. So, color volume is a concept relevant to visualize the brightness range of available hues, and is related both to high dynamic range, which expands on the limitations of SDR, and also a wider color gamut, which expands on the use that's available. Before starting to work in HDR, it's important to get familiar with the SMPTE SD2084 standard, which ratifies the perceptual quantizer electro-optical transfer function, also known as the PQ curve, created by Dolby. The PQ curve allows for maximum brightness of 10,000 nits, and requires a signal with a bit depth of at least 10 bits. The perceptual quantizer was developed in relationship to how the human visual system interprets the world, which it does in a non-linear fashion. As an example, in a room lit by 50 candles, the amount of change of doubling the amount of candles to 100 is seen as an equally large step as removing half of the candles to 25, therefore making the human visual system more sensitive to low light. In PQHDR, half of the code values are used in the 100 nit range, meaning that 10-bit HDR double the amounts of code values in the SDR range compared to traditional 8-bit video. Another important difference between a regular gamma curve in SDR and the perceptual quantizer is their relative versus absolute nature. In traditional SDR, the actual output brightness of a code value is dependent on the display and its settings, while in PQHDR, a code value refers to specific brightness output of the display. There's a lot more to be said about this approach, and the problems with it, and how Dolby Vision and HDR10 and HDR10 Plus tries to solve those by using static and dynamic metadata. But that's a topic for another time. Before attempting to create your own HDR video, it's important to get familiar with the medium. There are a lot of HDR10 movies available on Blu-ray, and Netflix supports Dolby Vision. You can also find some high quality HDR content on YouTube. To do this, you will need an HDR capable TV, which you also will be needing later. Some of you might be able to afford a real HDR capable grading monitor, but for most of us it's simply too expensive at this point in time. I will present two different approaches to monitor your HDR footage, which requires different equipment. In the first approach, you will use a regular grading monitor to monitor your footage in SDR. Combined with HDR scopes, this actually can work, and you can always verify your progress later by playing it back on your HDR TV. This is done for example by uploading the video to YouTube. In the second approach, you will monitor in HDR on your TV, and this requires a video card that's compatible with your color grading software. I actually use a hybrid between these two approaches, and I use my regular SDR grading monitor at my primary display and occasionally verify the progress in HDR on my TV. If you can't activate HDR mode manually on your TV, you will need a card that supports HDMI 2.0a to be able to send HDR metadata. If you already own an expensive video card, you can also get for example the ADA Hi5 4K+, which can manually inject HDR metadata into your video feed. 
Another thing to think about is that you always want to use the most color accurate picture profile on your TV. On my LG C7 is the Technicolor profile. So it's time to show you how I created my first HDR video for YouTube called Söndagslugnet. All footage was shot on the Blackmagic Design Pocket 4K camera in RAW. I guess I could use 10-bit 42 log encoded footage as well, like ProRes 42 HQ for example. But I really think that RAW is to prefer when working in HDR. As you can see, I used the Inch Resolve, and I have my edit locked off and it's ready for color grading. And the first thing I need to do is change the project settings. In my approach, I'm using a color managed workflow. Here, you don't have to set the input color space if you don't want to, but in this case, Resolve automatically recognizes the Pocket 4K RAW footage anyways, so that's what I set it to. Timeline color space is something I choose to taste. I've heard that it's good to set this color space to something that can act as a big container when working in HDR. But for this project, Rec. 9 Gamma 2.4 seemed to work just fine for me. This choice will also affect how gradient controls behaves. Output color space is very important, and should be set to ST2084. You can also choose a brightness value if you want Resolve to impose a hard clip at a certain point. Since this project is being graded for 1000 nits, that's what I chose. Even if my TV isn't capable of displaying that amount of brightness, it's nice to have clip invisible in the scopes. You can also limit the output color gamut if you want to. I set mine to P3 D65. The rest of these settings is something you can experiment with. I found that the red IPP2 gamut mapping with highlight roll-off set to medium seems to work good for me. I also set the HDR peak nits to 1000. Now we should add a nice HDR image in PQ to work with. Here you can see how the HDR image is represented in SDR. It's quite flat and boring. If you're using a video card with HDMI 2.0a, you want to go back to the color management and also check the HDR master 4 box and set it to 1000 nits. This lets the TV know that we are mastering for 1000 nits. To activate HDR mode on your TV, you also need to go to the master settings and check Enable metadata over HDMI. If you have problems getting your TV into HDR mode, try going to the timeline settings and enable metadata over HDMI there as well. Now, if you want to grade using a regular SDR monitor, then you can add a LUT to convert the flat looking HDR image into SDR. In the color management, add the HDR 1000 nits to gamma 2.4 LUT. I set it so it affects both the external monitor and the software viewer. Make sure to remove the LUT before exporting, or if you want to view the feed on your TV in HDR mode. Also, set the scope slot to no LUT selected to be able to view the full HDR waveform. If you let the LUT affect the waveform as well, it will clip the signal at 100 nits. Speaking of scopes, go to Preferences, User, Color and choose Enable HDR scopes for ST2084 to get the actual nit value displayed instead of a 10-bit scale. Now you're ready to start grading in HDR. I'm only going to give a brief demonstration of how I graded this project in HDR. If you're interested in seeing a complete grading session, please let me know. I typically like to work with groups, and I find it really useful. In this case, I have no group pre-clip adjustments. This is because of the color managed workflow. In a non-color managed workflow, I use a LUT, color space transform, or other adjustments to normalize the footage here. On the clip level, I have a node to match the footage to other clips in the same scene. I also tend to use secondary keys and shapes here. In this case, I have applied windows to adjust the brightness in specific parts of the image. The actual look of this video was then created as group post-clip adjustments. I have an overall contrast adjustment and some basic chroma corrections. I also played around with a node in YUV color to get the look of this particular video. Lastly, I added a node to remove some magenta color I didn't like. On the timeline level, I've added a bit of overall sharpening and grain. I also have a node for viewing in black and white here, as well as false color. To demonstrate the limitation of this approach of grading HDR video in SDR, let's look at a clip which is a bit brighter. Here you can see that the viewer clips the information about 100 nits. But as you can see, in the waveform monitor, the whole signal is there. And if you want to look at the highlights, simply add a node and use custom curves to lower or compress the brightness. 
When working this way, I tend to treat the image more or less as an SDR image, but with more latitude, which I think is a good thing. Usually, you don't want to make super bright images. When you're done with your grade, remember to remove the SDR conversion LUT before exporting. As I said earlier, this LUT should not be used if you want to monitor in HDR, for example on your HDR TV. Exporting your high dynamic range video is no different than exporting your regular video. Because of the color match workflow, Resolve will make sure that the video is tagged with the proper metadata. And if you decide to upload your video to YouTube, it will recognize as PQ HDR. So that concludes this tutorial. If you have any thoughts or questions, please leave a comment below. Also, remember to like and subscribe for more videos. Thanks for watching. Until next time, goodbye.